I, I'm, I'm at this lake right now because there's a fish in here that I'm trying to find that's followed me on three different dives now. And I named him Elvis. You can check out some of the videos on my, on my page. But uh, he's followed me on three separate dives in this gigantic lake. This lake has 27 miles of shoreline. That's amazing. And I found the same, same fish. And I know, I know he's the same fish because he's got an injury to his lip. That was a, a previous uh, fishing injury is what I'm guessing. I see a lot of that. Um, but he's got a very distinct look. He's got like, a, like an Elvis snarl. Um, so I named him Elvis. But, uh, but going back to it, I mean, it's, there's so much more going on with these creatures. And I think um, my goal is to get people to kind of see, um, you know, the deeper aspect of them and, and that they're not just mechanical creatures. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. This is episode number 128, and we're speaking with Rex Calubra. Rex is a longtime reptile keeper out of the U.S., and he's also a content creator on YouTube. His channel is called Rex Calubra's All Animal Channel. This episode is mainly focused on bonding and connecting with your reptiles. We even discuss how to tame a snake or tame a reptile that is really aggressive and scared down to something that's a lot more relaxed and cooperative to work with. The one thing I really like about the way Rex conceptualizes keeping reptiles is he treats each animal that he owns, not each species, each individual animal as an individual sentient being. And he treats them as if they are as intelligent as any other animal on this earth. And I do think that is so important. I think that is the perfect first step when it comes to caring for animals in captivity because it really means that you're going to be approaching it in the most ethical way possible. And I think this episode may even wander into some territory that makes people uncomfortable. We know so little about reptile intelligence. We know so little about how reptiles perceive their world that sometimes I think we just water it down and simplify it down to something that's just so basic that we are underestimating how potently intelligent these animals are. And Rex, that, he uses that as his starting point. And I think some people who are very, you know, need the peer-reviewed paper to prove something may not want to go there. Although I think it's really important that we do because observation and anecdotal statements and anecdotal experiences come way before peer-reviewed research. And I think this is such an important way for us to start when it comes to caring for animals is treating them in this respectful and loving way. And it also allows you to have a tighter and more substantial relationship with your animals because you're not going to be, they're not going to be as afraid of you and vice versa. We also discuss cohabbing. He has a really interesting cohabbing project between a couple hog island boas and some Brazilian rainbow boas. So that might be controversial for some people, but he talks about how it works and some tips that you can use to make sure that if you are cohabbing, that you will be successful. We talk about DIY enclosure building, and we also talk about some of the incredible diving that he does in these really crystal clear lakes that he has around his area. And he has some amazing stories about interacting with wild fish in that in those settings so i do really hope you enjoy this episode it's full of amazing just incredible stories from rex so i have no doubt that you will enjoy the episode if you're looking for more information on this episode make sure you head to animals at home network.com if you are also interested in supporting this podcast financially you can do that for as little as three dollars per month over at patreon.com slash animals at home all support through that patreon channel is greatly appreciated directly goes towards producing the show and making sure that i get it out for you guys on a regular hopefully somewhat regular basis as i get back into the swing of things here if you are interested in supporting the podcast any other way the best thing you can do is just share it share it on instagram or facebook that really does help or you can give us a rating on the spotify or the apple podcasting app of course five stars is the appropriate amount of stars to give hopefully if you do enjoy it Thank you so much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. And I think that is it. Let's jump into the episode. Enjoy. Well, Rex, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for doing this. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our chat. We've uh, connected 
through YouTube uh, probably a year and a half ago or maybe more, and we've been staying in touch, and you're a, a really cool animal keeper, and so there's lots we can talk about today, and I, I think this conversation will get into areas that I think some of the listeners may or may not be comfortable with as far as some of the animal connection pieces that I want to touch on for sure with you. I think there are some people that might be more closed-minded to that sort of stuff, and you have to be more of an open-minded individual for, for some of these topics. So I'm really looking forward to kind of pushing the boundaries there. But before we do that, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself as far as animals and nature is concerned? Because I get the sense that you are an animal lover just in general. Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I had the good luck of being uh, raised out in the country. and so. Um, it was pretty sweet uh, just being out in the middle of nowhere, usually just me and my dog. I mean, there was a couple of neighbor kids, but for the most part, it was kind of just me and my dog. And we'd go wandering around and catching, you know, turtles and frogs and all sorts of stuff, bringing home baby bunnies and, you know, everything else. And then um, my grandparents had a farm. And so I spent a lot of time out there uh, with their goats and chickens and, um, you know, whatever else out there that they had. And um, I just grew up just surrounded by nature, surrounded by animals. I remember being about five years old and swimming in the lakes, um, you know, around my area and just being underwater and pretending I was a turtle. Um, you know, as I got older, that love just grew. It just, it's, it's never gone away. Um, I know a lot of people kind of go through you know, their animal phase or their, their dinosaur phase. I mean, I still get amazed when I see dinosaur bones. Like when I go to a museum or even when I'm online looking at stuff, it's like, wow, that thing lived at one point. Like mm -hmm. that's crazy. Like so crazy. Um, so I, I guess I never really lost that childhood wonder. Um, and so whenever I'm out, you know, in nature or whenever I'm out, um, you know, somewhere where it's just, it's real wild. Like right now I'm on the lake shore. I can kind of show you guys. A yeah. Bit. For anyone listening, Rex is sitting in front of a beautiful, looks like pretty much crystal clear lake. Yeah. I'm actually, if you can tell, I got my dive suit on. As soon as I'm done recording this, I'm going to get in the water. <laughs> oh, excellent. Yeah. Beautiful scenery. So you've always been someone that likes to be outside. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of my thing. And, um, you know, animals have always seemed to, you know, for a lack of better terms, gravitate towards me. Um, I remember being a little kid and having, you know, the neighbor's dogs following me home and, you know, cats and stuff like that and various different animals. Um, I'd always be bringing home toads and snakes and stuff like that and freaking out my mom. And, Can I keep it? Can I keep it? And um, after a long enough time, I, I did wear her down <laughs> and uh, I was able to get keep a, a garter snake that I caught but um it ended up getting loose and that was the end of that for a little bit <laughs> but then um a little later in my life when I was about 10 or 11 uh I probably couldn't have had a better better luck um I met this guy who at the time this was like mid 90s um I met this guy who had a bunch of Burmese pythons and green iguanas he had a savannah monitor and he was the guy that lived in my small town. And so I, of course, just being obsessed with reptiles and animals and stuff, I just would bug the shit out of this guy <laughs> going over to his house and, hey, can I help you clean the tanks? And, you know, are you feeding them anybody today? I just would, you know, I'd go and hang out with this dude. He was really cool, actually. Super, super cool guy. And uh, I just go and hang out at his house. And um, how things ended up working out was he uh, ended up, hooking up with my mom and then they had my little brother and they ended up getting married and um, I was with them for quite a while. So I had, I mean, I would say a pretty big jump um, as far as my knowledge base goes on reptiles and reptile keeping just because of his influence. That's amazing. So, so when you, what was the first species that you started keeping? Obviously you had the garter snake that did the uh, Houdini trick, but then after that, what did you start getting into? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had the garter snake that got out, and then um, I had gotten a pair of green iguanas, and they weren't exactly what I wanted, but I was still pretty excited about it, and they just, they would never calm down. They were always so flighty and freaked out, and I mean, keep in mind, I was 10 years old, so 
it just wasn't a good fit. So I ended up bringing it back to, to, um, the, the guy that was my, ended up being my dad, uh, his name's Joe. I ended up bringing it back to him. And then we went to a reptile show and I picked out a ball python, which is actually what I really wanted. And so I got the ball python. He was just a, you know, regular phase, uh, ball python. And I was absolutely in love with him. He was awesome. And I had him for probably like two years. And then I had built a, uh, a custom enclosure for him and the Burmese python that I had. And being a 12-year-old carpenter, uh, my skills weren't exactly that good. <laughs> and he got out, and uh, I never found him. Oh, damn. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, a common story pretty, for sure. Yep. So it was, it was pretty rough. But, um, but yeah, that was my, my first one. And then I had the Burmese python. She was an albino. Um, I got her from Joe. Um, she was one that he had bred and uh, raised her up for quite a while. And then she ended up getting a respiratory infection and died. Um, but again, you know, being a kid and, you know, also being kind of early on in the, the hobby, um, you know, we really didn't know too much about kind of treating that stuff. And there wasn't really ducks available, um, you know, that could really do anything about them. Have you since then you've been keeping reptiles pretty much that whole time, I assume, because now you do have a, a a collection, but has it been just sort of a spattering of species between now and then? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I've pretty much always had something. I mean, whether it's a, you know, a turtle or a gecko or um, tarantulas, I mean, you name it. I had pet rats, I've had pet mice. Um, I mean, I think the only thing I haven't had a pet of is like a horse. <laughs> I think I've just not had a horse. So to yeah, count yeah. all the other things. <laughs> but uh but yeah, um the, the the reptile thing, I've had probably God, it's it's hard to say. I mean I've had a couple different monitors. I had a, a Savannah monitor, I had a Tamora monitor. Um the Savannah monitor was super cool. His name was Salvador and that dude got about three and a half feet. And he would take naps on my chest and he was so intelligent. I tell you what, man, you could walk into the room and if he didn't know who you were, he would actually come and investigate you. But if it was me walking in, he'd open his eye and then just close it and be like, Oh, it's just you. Yeah. And so it was really interesting to see like how he would interact with new people and new stimuli and stuff. Um, very, very clever little guy. Um, but I've had a bunch of other different like snakes and stuff like that. I've had uh, different ball pythons. I've had different boas. Um, I had a Taiwan rat snake at one point. She was really cool. Um, yeah, lots of different stuff, lots of different experience. I've worked for different places like pet stores and stuff like that that have um, had animals. I've take, uh, helped keep and, and maintain other people's collections and stuff like that. So um, yeah. But, uh, so one one thing that I see from you, like when I watch your videos or just, you know, chatting with you, you have a a pretty deep sense of the intelligence from reptiles. And I it's is that something that you've always had? Have you always had an intuition that these animals were more intelligent than than people were giving them credit for? Or Well, um, to be honest with you, I think it's it's more of something that I observed over time. Um I'd like to consider myself a fairly observant person. And so I, I noticed patterns and I noticed things. And I remember one time, I think I was like 14, 13 or 14. And I was out um, just scrounging around in the woods, looking under uh, sheets of tin that were by this old building. And there was uh, uh, a couple of garter snakes underneath there. And just, you know, some Eastern garter snakes. And I, lift up the tin and instead of reaching for them to, to grab them and pull them out and look at them or whatever, I had this idea of, well, let's just hold the tin up and watch them and see what they do. And when I did that, uh, one of the snakes immediately crawled off, but the other one stayed there and he was frozen and I stayed frozen. And then after a while, he kind of was like, well, he's not trying to eat me. And then he slowly started flicking his tongue and he slowly started coming over. And I'm not even joking. He, he was sniffing my shoes with his tongue. 
and he's going around my shoes and he's kind of going around. He's, he's tasting my, my pant leg. And then, uh, and then he just kind of crawled off. And it was in that moment that I was like, I mean, that's kind of interesting. I mean, that's, that's, he was definitely curious and showing, um, you know, that he was more curious than afraid. And I think the big thing is, um, you know, that, that kind of triggered that. And I saw it in my own snakes too, my pet snakes. Um, but that's kind of different because, you know, if you think about it, a pet snake is one that, you know, I've adopted or I've bought whatever I've taken. And now it's in my care. Whereas a wild snake or a wild animal that it's free to run, it's free to take off if it wants to. Um, but so to see that behavior in a wild animal, in a wild snake, especially, um, really, really triggered my mind. Like, wow. I mean, he wanted to come see what I was all about. And as soon as he realized that I wasn't a threat and that I wasn't reaching for him or doing anything, uh, you know, drastic or, or chaotic, um, he wanted to come and, and take a look and see, you know, what I was all about. Yeah, it's pretty interesting how those early experiences can can do that because it, it and it does seem like you implement that into how you treat your animals. You treat them like entities and things that have their own ability to do what they want and and allow them to be curious. And you don't treat them like uh, you don't treat them like they're just you know very basic creatures. You treat them like they are intelligent animals that that can process the world around them. Absolutely. Um... I, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we're making as, as a whole, as people, um, is looking at animals as, as some sort of mechanistic uh, thing that relies solely on instinct and is kind of, you know, doesn't really have a lot going on upstairs. I think that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, and just what I've seen in my personal experience with not only reptiles, but all sorts of other different creatures, um, when they don't perceive us as a threat, they get very curious, they get very interested. And from my understanding, curiosity is a sign of, a, a, of an intelligent mind. Mm -hmm. And so when I see the way they interact with me and then they interact with each other, um, it's over time, it's built this picture, this idea that there is so much more going on. Um, and that, you know, these are individual creatures. I mean, each animal is its own thing. It's its own individual. And dog owners, cat owners, everybody knows that there's, you know, almost no two dogs alike. You know, sure, they're still dogs, right? They have a universal uh, characteristics that make them dogs. But they all have their own little quirks. They all have their own little preferences. Um, you know, same thing with cats and everything else. And it's, it, it goes all the way down the line, all the way down to, I mean, everything. Fish. I, I'm, I'm at this lake right now because there's a fish in here that I'm trying to find that's followed me on three different dives now. And I named him Elvis. You can check out some of the videos on my, on my page. But uh, he's followed me on three separate dives in this gigantic lake. This lake has 27 miles of shoreline. That's amazing. And I found the same, same fish. And I know, I know he's the same fish because he's got an injury to his lip. That was a, a previous uh, fishing injury is what I'm guessing. I see a lot of that. Um, but it, he's got a very distinct look. He's got like, a, like an Elvis snarl. Um, so I named him Elvis. But, uh, but going back to it, I mean, it's, there's so much more going on with these creatures. And I think um, my goal is to get people to kind of see, um, you know, the deeper aspect of them and, and that they're not just mechanical creatures, that they're not just, um, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, they're not human. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say that, you know, they're exactly like us, but I'm also not going to say I'm not exactly like a fish. Figure out how to engage with that creature on its level um, I mean, you can befriend anything. I've, I had a friendly snapping turtle. Mm -hmm. I had uh, snakes that the the Taiwan rat snakes that I had. She was straight up vicious when I first got her. She bit me multiple times. 
she would defecate and, and musk multiple times um, when I first got her. But after about a month or so of gentle handling and just that respect and kindness, um, she went from being crazy psycho snake to the kind of animal that I could put around a child's neck mm-hmm. or I could take to a school and, you know, show people that, Hey, these aren't scary, mean monsters that, you know, they're really just scared is what it comes down to. And I think one of the big things to realize is that we need to put it in perspective. We're giant monsters compared to a lot of these, keep, these animals that we keep and a lot of the creatures that we encounter, except for like a bear or a cow. Mm-hmm. And even they have an instinctual fear of us because of the damage that we've done with sport hunting and various other different things, right? So I think the thing is, is to respect uh, the creature and realize that they see us as scary. We need to break that that boundary and show them that, Hey, I'm not a threat. I'm a friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. And so I think you hit the nail on the head with the word respect. It's just respecting them as a being. And then I guess also you have to be patient, right? I think so many of us want to rush into taming these animals. Like I just got a new snake. It's really mean. It's snapping at me every chance it gets. And they want it to be like a week of taming, but really you have to interact with the animal in a respectful manner. And it has to go on for a while. You, You can't just Oh, expect yeah. it to be quick. It's got to be, you got to be a very long and patient process waiting for them to come to you rather than the other way around. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the biggest thing is, is patience, um, respect, and, uh, uh, you know, time. You know, you got to give it time. Um, and as corny as it sounds, being loving, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, if, I mean, if you think about your interactions with a human or with a dog, that person or that dog or that creature that you're interacting with is going to respond to you so much better and so much deeper. If you come from the heart, if you're actually loving and, um, you know, you're not looking at them as like some kind of commodity or some kind of plaything. And that's, uh, you know, kind of getting back to it. That's one of the things that hurts me about some reptile keepers is, you know, they look at it like it's a, it's an ego accessory or it's some sort of a, a plaything, And I think that's just really sad. You know, it's sad for the animal and it's kind of pathetic and sad for that person. Um, you know, these are living beings. And if it wasn't for us, you know, grabbing them out of the wild and putting them in a cage, you know, they'd be wandering around doing their thing. And sure, nature is harsh and there's a lot of dangers out there, but you know, it's freedom, mm-hmm. you know? Well, and this is the part of the... Oh, yeah, conver- go, okay. oh no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, to answer your question, yes, patience is one of the biggest things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, there's not a lot of things in this world that come to you fast. You know, not, not, not a lot of good things come fast. Mm-hmm. Um, think about, like, martial arts. No one's going to be a black belt martial art their second week out. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. You know, everything takes time. It takes baby steps. Yeah, it's so true. And I, I think this is part of the conversation where people who are very scientifically minded, who almost require a peer-reviewed paper on everything to before they allow themselves to believe the fact, this is where that might get, you know, on, on uneven ground for the people who think that way. Because I think, like you said, that loving approach is actually really important. And a part of it is just the energy that you're giving off, but also just calming yourself down. And we, we've talked about before, you know, off air about horses, and you had mentioned them earlier. Horses are, are incredibly intuitive for like the energy around them. And Absolutely. if you approach a horse and you're very afraid, they will act very nervous. They, they, they just know that this person next to them is a a nervous person and they're going to be ready to bolt at at any point because they don't trust you. And I imagine that happens on every level with animals and same with dogs. People who are afraid of dogs make dogs afraid of them. And then it becomes a really negative interaction. There's really no reason that doesn't go all the way down to snakes and and lizards. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ask Lori Torini. If Mm -hmm. you're nervous around a horse, that horse is, you know, going to be very nervous around you. Um, it's, it's all about the energy that you put off. And when we're loving, when we're coming from an, an approach of care, 
and this doesn't have to be like, you know, I'm going to give my lizard a kiss. You know, this is about just genuinely being from the heart, like, Hey, what's up little buddy. And looking at him like he's your friend and not like, um, you know, not an object. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And for the science, the scientific, uh, minded people, I mean, think about like a baby, a newborn baby. It could have all of the physical requirements that it would need to survive. It could have all the milk it needs. It could be plenty warm, but without the mother uh, present or a loving, some sort of loving human companion, infants die. It just is what it is. You can't keep a baby alive in a factory. And so there is a principle, there is an emotional principle um, to life that I feel like science and, you know, everybody tripping on the facts uh, tends to overlook. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. And that's, I think one of the Everything's, areas where we get hung up, especially in the reptile world, because we don't recognize it as easily. So we just stick in the facts world and we can actually miss all of that emotional intelligence really, really easily. Right. Right. Exactly. And the thing is, is that reptiles aren't, they're not a dog. They're not a human. They're not a cat. They have their own way. And I mean, even the difference between the way a turtle shows its affection and its, its uh, interest, we'll say, uh, with you is completely different than the way um, a different species of turtle might interact with you. Or say a snake. Everything is different. Everything has got its own unique way. Um, but there is a universality in approaching each creature and the things that I've noticed is being slow. Um, but at the same time, not being so still that you look like a predator stalking. You know what I mean? Um, I've had like a mother duck being out in the wild. I've had a mother duck and about 12 ducklings go directly underneath my feet within like kicking distance. We'll say, um, on the shoreline. And all I was doing was just talking to them in a calm voice. Hey guys, how's it going? They don't perceive you as a threat because think about every predator out there for the most part, they attack in, in a a quick, usually ambush, um, and, and very fast, uh, a speedy attack, right? Like they come down fast and they generally don't uh, uh, announce their presence. Exactly. Right. So predators, when they want to attack, they're silent. And then all of a sudden they lunge out real quick and then, you know, then it's over. So when you start talking, especially in a calm, uh, you know, relaxed manner, when you start talking to animals and you're moving around just a little bit, I think when I was, uh, when I had that, those ducks go underneath me, I was whittling a stick, right? Like I'm sharpening a point on a stick with a knife, right? So I'm moving a little bit, but I'm not, uh, moving in large you know, kind of, uh, uh, threatening manners yeah. you know, or mannerisms. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean, animals have a, and we all have it. We, you can recognize a person that looks sketchy, right? Someone who's just not moving in the way that a relaxed person is moving or, or speaking or their tone of voice. Like all of that is, is built into our genetics and it's very easy for us to recognize. And it would be the same for animals. People, animals can recognize right. when they need to you know, run or fight back. And, and especially with snakes, I think one thing that I see, I know you do, and I see a lot of people do as well is just opening up the enclosure, letting them come out and letting them come to you, letting them be curious, right? Smell your hand and and climb up. And that is that trusting process, knowing that you're not going to just go in there and, you know, grab them and yank them out of the enclosure. Right. Right. Exactly. Like when I'm first getting, uh, acclimated to it, or I should say when I'm first getting a snake acclimated to me, um, or really any reptile, the biggest thing that I do as far as for starting is putting my hand in the enclosure and then just leaving it there, right? Like I'm not going to grab at them. Um, I'm not going to move around any, uh, objects in the enclosure, you know, none of the furniture is going to be moved around and, uh, and I'm going to stand there you know, usually as long as my knees and my body will will allow, but I'll stand there and I'll kind of just gently talk to them. Um, A lot of times I won't make eye contact because in the the animal world, a lot of times predators are the ones that make eye contact. And so um, they can sometimes see that as threatening. So a lot of times looking, you know, at your own hand or looking away 
and just talking to them gently, you know, speaking to them as if they were, you know, a small child or a good friend of yours um, and just kind of letting them know you're there. And then slowly, you know, starting to, you know, maybe move stuff around or take them out. Um, the best thing you can do if you have a large enough enclosure is to go inside of it and just sit, sit with it. Yeah. Um, when I was younger, like I said, my, my dad had, uh, I call my dad, even though my stepdad, but he, uh, he had a bunch of iguanas and stuff like that. So he had these huge custom made enclosures that he built. Um, and this one was like the size of like a small bathroom. It was huge. And so I could go in there and I'd sometimes bring my friends on like Saturday mornings, you know, like sleep over and stuff. And, um, we'd, we'd, uh, wake up in the morning and just go hang out in snake cage. And what was so cool. And I, you know, just again, observation and noticing what they're doing. Um, when we would sit down inside the cage, again, as long as you're you know, calm and relaxed, they'll come out of their hides and they'll come crawl all over you mm-hmm. and, and, smell you and investigate um and so having that experience um you know with the snakes that i had when i was younger i really wanted to relive that so when i built the custom cage that i built uh for my snakes i built it big enough to where i can have a a small seat in there and they do the exact same thing as my snakes did before when i sit inside there give it about usually 10 minutes 15 minutes and at least one of them's coming out to come sniff me well, and th- just to highlight the, how different that is. So there's, you can either pull a snake out of its environment and pull it into your environment and have it interact with you, or you can step into their environment and have them interact with you. And they would be way more comfortable with the second scenario because they're really comfortable with the environment. They're, it's their enclosure. It smells like them. They're familiar with everything. And then obviously you stepping in there, that might be a new thing. They maybe are nervous at first, but then they become more comfortable. It's not a, f- a completely brand new environment and a crazy stimulus of a, you know, a big monkey picking you up basically. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And the thing is, if you have to pick them up, which I mean, obviously a lot of folks don't have uh, a large enough cage to climb inside or, you know, maybe the snake doesn't come out to to sniff them. So sometimes you do have to take them out and then acclimate them uh, uh, with you. And I think the best way to go about this, and these are just suggestions, nobody has to listen to anything that I say, but um, but it's just stuff that's worked for me. And so Um, in in my experience, I've noticed that when you take the snake out and you find a a quiet place, like say like, um, a den or an office or, you know, a room that nobody's going to be in and find a comfortable area to sit down, whether it's a chair or a couch or whatever. And then, um, what I do is I just, I pick them up gently and then I don't ever manhandle my snake, um, one of the things I've noticed with them is that they absolutely hate manipulating their body. Mm-hmm. So like when you see somebody picking up a snake and they're doing one of these and they're like, Oh wow. So cool. Like that snake is, that's his worst day. Like he hates that. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I pick them up and I just, I make myself a tree and I'd be as still as possible. And then when I sit down, I get myself comfortable. I set them on my lap or somewhere close. And then I just sit there with them. Mm-hmm. Usually I talk to them. Um, you know, again, gently and just kind of in a a calm manner, but I just sit with them. And if it's a new snake and you're trying to get them acclimated to you, I would suggest maybe doing that like 20 minutes to a half hour. Um, obviously the longer, if they're, if they're relaxed, you know, draw it out longer if you can, but I would do that a couple of times, um, a week, you know, if not maybe every other day. And, uh, and they will calm down. The biggest thing is also, too, um, when you go to reach and, and grab for them, is if they're very flighty or uh, fear, fear aggressive, you can use a hook to pick them up. Mm-hmm. Or what I do is I, instead of reaching down and grabbing them like this, I slide my hand along the substrate and then try to go under their bellies. Right. And a lot of times if you do it nice and slow, and you're relaxed and just kind of chilling, um, they really won't have a problem with it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's all about making that experience calming for them as well. And 
yeah, using a hook, there's nothing wrong with that because you also want to make yourself not afraid too, right? So if you need the distance with a hook, that that's totally fine. And, and maybe wear gloves if you're afraid right. to get bit. But if you are panicked, then you're just going to put that fear into them. So wh- why don't we talk a little bit about the animals that you have? You We talked about some stuff that you had in the past, but you have a couple, uh, you have three snakes right now, I think, or? I have four, four snakes right now. You're close. Um, I have two hog island boas, a male and female pair. And then I have two Brazilian rainbow boas, also okay. a male and female pair. And and tell me about your relationship with those animals. Um, it's really kind of goofy, actually, because um, they all love coming out and hanging out. Um, two of the four snakes, well, I call it begging to come out. It's where they basically will put their bodies up against the glass and then just sit there and kind of watch me or move their head back and forth to try to get my attention. They're not trying to escape because they're not, you know, pushing at the corners. They're, they're literally just trying to get my attention. They put their bellies up against the glass. Some people call it glass surfing. Um, they put their bellies up against the glass and they kind of move their head back and forth and they'll watch me turn their head sideways and they'll watch me. Um, but my two hog island boas will do that during the day. Um, my Brazilian rainbow boas will do that at, uh, when the lights are low. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot harder to, to videotape those guys doing that. But, um, but they'll all do it. And it's really funny because I open up the, the cage, the enclosure, however you want to say it. And I stick my hand out and it takes a second. You know, usually it's they, they got kind of process like, okay, he just opened the door. And then give it a second and they'll start crawling onto my hand. Sometimes they crawl on the floor, you know, wherever it's kind of, you know, up to them. But a lot of times they'll just crawl right up my hand, up my arm. Um, and the one snake that I have, Mojo, he's my male hog island boa. He does it all the time. He constantly wants to come hang out. And in fact, as I was getting ready to come out here, he was at the glass begging. And I was like, dude, I can't right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um but he will do it all the time in fact he did it twice yesterday and i took him out twice yesterday and um what i do with them is it's really simple i just i take a blanket i put it over the couch over the back and over the the front um and then i kind of squish the the blanket in between the, the cushions just a little bit and then i take a couple of pillows and i put the pillows on that and then I kind of fold the blankets over the pillows just a little bit and I'll put them in the folds. And as soon as he's in there, he's like a pig in mud. He just, he loves it. He, he'll get himself comfortable and then he'll just chill out. And if I'm sitting on the couch with him, a lot of times he'll come up and he'll crawl and he'll put himself on my lap. Um, it's just such an interesting, he, he's got such an interesting personality, such an interesting little guy. Uh, at the old house, he used to do the same thing, um, but it was a different kind of enclosure that I had. So it was a 210 gallon with a flip top, and it was a top that I had designed and built. Um, and so instead of nosing at the top, he would put his uh, belly up against the glass, and then he would move his head back and forth and just kind of wait for me. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, he'd get a little antsy, but, uh, but he would wait for me and then I'd take him out and then I'd sit down and he'd curl up somewhere and then we'll sit there for hours. <laughs> yeah. So well, actually my male boa does uh, something. I, I imagine this would be a speculation, but I think male boas in the wild must be more active than females. And it would kind of make more sense. The males are the ones that have to go out on their journey, normally find females, but I find my male is really active and same thing. He'll kind of you know, pace the glass and I open it and he comes right out and he'll spend hours exploring the basement going around and, and they just appreciate that extra space. And, and, and the enclosure, can you tell us a little bit about the enclosure that you just recently built that you have them in right now? Cause it, like you said, you can fit in it. So it's pretty big. Yeah. Um, so I just recently built, um, a build in enclosure. So it's like, it looks like it's part of the wall. Um, you can't move it around. It's attached. And, um, it is, as far as the specs, it's about seven feet tall. Um, the full length of it is about eight feet, but it incorporates 
a small walk-in closet. So there's, it's kind of got a funky footprint. The outside um, part that's in the, the actual bedroom area is about 36 by 32. And then it's got a beveled um, front end. So it kind of looks like a, a stand-up shower stall. And then the back uh, goes in another about five feet. And that's the walk-in closet. Yeah, so it's a, it's a big space. Now, am, am, am I wrong or do you keep all four of those uh, four boas in there at once? Yep. Yeah, yep. they're all, all, our, all our house together. Um, so the reason I do that is because A, I can offer them a, a lot larger of an enclosure. Um, and B, they have the boas that I have have the same requirements, right? And then also, um, I like to offer gradients not only with heat and light, but also with humidity. So um, they have their humid hides that stay humid all the time. Um, and then I spray the, the floor of the tank or the floor of the enclosure rather. And, um, and then the upper air or the upper parts where the branches and stuff are usually stays a little bit drier. Um, and, and then there's also certain parts of the, the enclosure that I don't spray. So they have the opportunity to be, um, you know, about 90% humidity in their humid hides. Um, to about more of like a 70, um, 60, 70% in other areas. And then there's other areas that it gets to, you know, probably more like 50 or, or 40. Yeah. Well, and this is, a, you know, we did a whole episode on, on cohabbing. If anyone wants to go back and listen to that, they can learn all about cohabbing. But that's one of those areas in the hobby that some people are totally for, some people are completely against, and then most people are somewhere in the middle, I would think. And uh, I think... Have you had any issues with with them cohabbing in the same enclosure? Like you said, it's the same, it's the same uh, similar requirements anyway, and they they come from a similar part of the world, obviously. Yeah, well, um, man, I've been. I, I know there's it, it's split just like everything else in the world, but um, I've been cohabitating snakes since I was, I think, ten or eleven, since I, I first got that ball python and um, and whatnot, because Joe. Uh, my stepdad, he had uh, all of his snakes housed together. And he basically kind of taught me the rules. And it's actually really common sense. Um, and when I start to explain this, you'd be like, oh, duh. Oh, oh yeah, duh. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So um, obviously, no snake eating snakes. Duh, right? I'm not going to put a king snake in with a, a garter snake. That's mm -hmm. obviously a recipe for disaster. Um, no snakes that are, you know, obviously a desert snake wouldn't go well with a jungle snake. Um, a snake that, you know, is predominantly a tree snake might not do so well in the same habitat unless it was set up correctly with a snake that, you know, is more terrestrial or ground-based. Um, size, you don't want a huge snake with a tiny snake. Um, obviously boas and pythons can't mix because of the viruses that can pass uh, back and forth. Um, and then, you know, requirements as far as their, their husbandry. Um, so Brazilian rainbow boas generally need a higher humidity, which, like I said, I have the, the humid hides and I also keep the, the substrate fairly moist. Um, I don't like to keep it sopping wet just because it can get gross, but I do keep it fairly moist. Um, and then the hog island boas have a pretty similar um, humidity requirement. And in fact, they oftentimes will hang out in the same spots. So I have multiple humid hides. Um, there's multiple cork hides. There's multiple everything because there's multiple snakes. And so um, a lot of times they'll hide in the same spot. Um, like the, the humid hides, a lot of times they'll all hang out in those together or whatever. But um, yeah, I've actually never had any problems and I've been doing it for over 20 some odd years, probably 30 years now. But um, uh, I've, I've really had never any problems with it because I've always kind of followed those rules. Um, when it comes to feeding, I never feed them in the same enclosure uh, together. I usually feed them in a tub and then as soon as they're done, I put them back in the enclosure. Um, I generally, as a rule of thumb, don't feed them in the enclosures anyway because I don't want them to be uh, expecting a meal. And even though I go in there a lot and you know, interact with them a lot, and they know the difference between me and food. They know the difference between the food 
and all those mediums to uh, the actual rat videos where uh, my snake was kind of in hunt mode because she was smelling a rat. And then I put my hand up there and she smelled it and didn't strike it, you know? So they can differentiate. They know the difference. Um, but it's, it's really interesting too to watch the way that they interact with each other well actually and can i pause you for the pictures can i can i pause you for a second i do want to hear about the interaction as well but just listening to you talk about you know having a boa in hunt mode at putting your hand in front of it that only works if the boa is very familiar with your scent right if you are a person and that's that's the importance of of having that interaction with the animal and and having calm experiences with them because they would associate your scent with calm and also not food where you know, a boa right. will hammer anything that moves if it's if it if it just goes after anything, right? Like they are so aggressive when they eat that if if you don't yeah, handle your part. animal and it doesn't know your smell, then I guess that could right. be a problem. But that just shows you how well your animals know you that you can do that with a boa. Because I'm not sure I could do that with my boas. I think they would grab me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and this is the thing is that I'm not. Please don't take my suggestions. Uh, or, or the things that I do as personal advice or as things to do uh, <laughs> to all the listeners out there. Um, these are things that have worked for me and I've had success with them and you know I've done it throughout the years and it's just how I do it. You might not. Um, you know, Joe Schmo out there might not have the same results that I do. Um, and obviously there's different variables that come with that. Um, as far as the snake not striking my hand, I would say that's a, a pretty rare experience as far as like that particular scenario. Um, I would not recommend putting your hand in front of a boa that smells rats <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in most situations. Yeah. Um, it's just that this, these boas have been hand raised by me since they were neonates. Um, so I, you know, they, they know me quite well. Um, and so that knowledge of me and their interactions with me and that bond we have is enough to override that initial strike response with this, with the added smell of the, of the, the, uh, the rat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and another thing too, is that I don't want anybody to think that I'm some, you know, animal whisperer guru guy that's like never been bitten. I've been bitten a lot <laughs> by a lot of different things. I've been bitten by a woodchuck. Uh, I've been bitten by raccoons. I've been bitten by all sorts of stuff. Um, so you can get bit and you probably will get bit if you spend enough time with animals. It's just that every time that I've been bit, it was my fault. Yeah. I was doing something stupid. I wasn't respecting the animal in the situation. Um, and I, I took a hit, you know? So I, I want people to, to understand that even though my mom jokes around and calls me Dr. Doolittle, um, I, uh, the animals are still animals and they still can and will bite if they feel threat. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's get back to the interactions. I'm very curious how these two species interact with each other or do they even interact with each other in the enclosure? Or do they just pass by one another while they're in there? How does it, how does it all work? Yeah, well, so a lot of people think that snakes are solely uh, individual animals that, you know, don't uh, spend any time whatsoever with their own kind or around others. I've kind of seen the opposite of that. I've seen a lot of times where I've lifted up, um, you know, a sheep tin or a log or something, and there's multiple snakes under there or, you know, multiple different creatures and stuff. Also, too, I mean, think about cats, you know, cats are solitary animals, but I've seen plenty of people that have multiple cats in their houses and the cats get along great, you know, they sleep together, they bond. Um, so it's really all about the situation. And, um, and, you know, obviously when in doubt, you know, take them out or whatever, but um, I have noticed some really interesting things um, with my boas. My, so for example, my female hog island boa, her name is Pepper. And uh, she and the male are quite bonded to the point where they pretty much hang out um, just about all the time. It's kind of actually rare to see them sitting separate. But, um, and it's also interesting too, when she moves within about a minute or so, he'll follow. So if she's in one hide and decides to go up to the branches or whatever, give it a minute 
and you'll see his head poke out and then he's following and he goes up to where she's at. And it's really interesting. I see, um, I see them do that a lot. I also see them do a lot of, um, I don't know how you describe it, but it, I, at first I thought it was a courtship display, but where they'll, they'll rub heads a little bit and the male will, he'll sniff her head. He'll, he'll look his tongue onto her head. Um, they'll rub bodies and generally don't seem at all irritated by each other or um, in any way um, disturbed or aggressive towards each other. I mean, boa constrictors and rainbow boas are um, predominantly herbivores, or not herbivores, <laughs> predominantly uh, they feed on, on rodents, mammals and rodents and birds, but they also will eat lizards, frogs, stuff like that when they're young, but generally they don't eat other snakes. Um, that's true in the wild and, you know, I've, like I said, I've had these guys together for a long time and, uh, and I've never had any kind of issues with one attacking the other um, or anything like that. Now, that might not be the case in every scenario because, again, every, every animal is the same individual. Um, so just because my four boas get along doesn't mean that when I bring home that fit, that she'll be copacetic with the rest of it. You know I mean? So there's always variables, there's always um, exceptions to every rule. Um, again, it's just it's something that just works for me. So. Yeah, you just have to pay attention and, and make sure you're watching the enclosures and, and go into it slowly and yeah, I mean, there's plenty of people that cohab, plus a lot of zoos will do it as well. But the big thing is having the space for the animals to get away from each other. And that's what's interesting about having seeing them together so often is is there is enough space for them to be totally separated. So there's something about that. Maybe there is some sort of bond there. But what about, the, is there an interaction between the boa constrictors and the and the, and the rainbow boas? Or how, how does that work? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they hang out together. They'll, they'll sleep together. Um, they don't seem at all disturbed by each other when they move around. Um, and with snakes, a lot of times you can tell that they're disturbed because um, if they're really anxious and really disturbed, they'll crawl out of wherever they're at immediately, right? Um, if, if, you know, for some reason there's, say, a, loud, a really loud sound or, you know, something like that, a, a snake will generally flee and get out of where it's, where it's at, where it feels the danger zone is at. Um, and snakes will also respire uh, heavily. They'll breathe very heavily when they're irritated. They'll puff themselves up, try to make themselves look more threatening. Um, and I've, I've never seen that interaction uh, with my snakes. You know, I'll have one crawl on top of the other. And sometimes they'll stop, say like if one's moving and then the other one crawls on it, he might stop and freeze for a second. But there's never any kind of uh, strike, um, you know, there's never any like heavy breathing or, or fast uh, respiratory action. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've really never seen any, any aggression, um, but I have seen them hang out quite a bit. You know? and, and again, you know, I offer them a fairly large enclosure um, with height and um, width as well, uh, or length, I should say. And, um, and they oftentimes do choose to, to hang out together. Now, whether that's because it's a favorite spot or, you know, they do enjoy each other's company, you know, that's different. Um, like I said, I have seen it many, many times, dozens and dozens of times where, you know, one snake will move and then the other one will follow. Usually it's, it's the same species that do that. Um, like I said, my male uh, hog island boa generally likes to follow around my female. Um, but yeah, the, the hogs and the, and the Brazilians, they, they get along fine. Um, never, never any issues. Another thing too, is you, you obviously want to make sure that your snakes are healthy. Um, I got mine from a, a really reputable quality guy. Um, so I know that they they had a good, healthy head start and, um, you know, they don't have any problems. Um, another thing too, is when you're cohabiting multiple snakes, you have to be, Johnny on the spot with poop uh, cleanup. You have right. to spot clean. Like every day you have to look for poop. 
Um, and as soon as you see it, you got to pick it up, you know, because you don't want the other ones crawling in it. You don't want it to make a mess. Um, so it's really just as simple as that um, as, far as, as, as far as that goes. But to get back to your question, um, yeah, I mean, they, they do interact um, in, in very passive kind of ways. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like they're, they're rubbing on each other and, and, you know, doing a snake high five or anything like that, but um, they definitely don't uh, feel at all bothered by each other. I don't, I don't ever see signs of that. And if, as far as the rainbow boas go, seven feet of height is typically way more than you'd see anybody give. Are you seeing those animals climb a lot? Oh, oh, dude, these snakes, they make every, they make use of every inch of that space. They're all over the place. The, the rainbows, the, the hogs, and, you know, not just like climbing around and exploring, but also like relaxing. Like the rainbows, they do like to relax a lot in the, in the branches. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that you can tell that rainbows are, are semi-arboreal is that they have elongated front teeth, um, very similar to like a, uh, a green tree python or an emerald tree boa. It's not as pronounced. Um, they're not as thick or as heavy as uh, the teeth of those snakes, but they are elongated. When you watch them yawn, you'll mm-hmm. see the front parts uh, of the mouth of little teeth kind of kind of pop out a little bit you'll see that those are quite a bit longer than the other ones and i think the reason for that and this is purely my my uh speculation here but i think the reason for that is because since they feed a lot on birds um they have to be able to pierce through the feathers in order to get a, a purchase on the meat you know what i mean because if they like the the teeth of let's say like a burmese python or a ball python, they're kind of short all the way down the line. And those snakes generally, these are generalizations, I'm sure people will beat me up about it, but uh, generally they feed on uh, rodents and mammals. And so when they go to bite those kind of creatures, they don't have that, the feathers uh, to worry about because um, I've seen times where I've fed um, like a live bird, like a live, chicken to snakes before where the snake goes to strike it and the bird gets away because it doesn't have uh, a good hold. Yeah. And so um, with like the hog islands, because um, with their, um, their evolution process on the islands that they live, they, they mostly feed on birds. Right. Yeah. Um, from everything, everything that I've read, there's like a three month window where all these migratory birds come and land on the island and have their babies and stuff. And then the rest of the time, the island's almost desolate, right? So they've got to be able to feast when the feast is there. And one of the things that I've noticed with them compared to the mainland boas is that their front teeth are more elongated as well. Mm. Um, So just like the Brazilian rainbow boas and and very similar, like I said, to green tree pythons and uh, emerald tree boas is that those front teeth, I'm not going to call them fangs because they're not, um, but those front teeth are quite a bit longer. And I think the reason behind that is to be able to get birds. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And I think that really shows us there's more arboreality in the rainbow boa for sure. And, and one actually experience that you had with your hog islands was having them outside and actually having one of them grab a wild bird, I think unintentionally on your part, but you had posted a video on your YouTube channel, actually. Can you tell us that story? Cause that, that's yeah. pretty remarkable. Yeah, actually it was pretty wild. So I've, I've had reptiles, my, like I said, my whole life and I've never had an experience where one of my snakes has caught a wild animal before. Uh, it's <laughs> pretty nuts. So I had them out, um, outside and when it's nice out, I have like this little, uh, teepee thing that I made out of, uh, branches that I kind of just kind of wired together and I'll, I'll kind of dress it up a little bit with some, uh, fake plants and stuff like that. And then I bring out some pork rounds and I put it out and, and I have like a fairly open spot for them to kind of hang out and get some sun and some fresh air. And, uh, I had Mojo out, uh, chilling on the thing and he, I, I leave him out there for hours. You know, I, I keep an eye on them, right? I don't, I'm not going to go to work and <laughs> leave them out on the thing. 
um, cause they will eventually crawl off. But, um, so I had them out there and I'm just kind of doing stuff around the house and around the yard and stuff. And all of a sudden I hear a squawking and I kind of just assumed that it was, you know, my cat or a neighbor's cat getting a, a hold of a bird because it happens quite often in the neighborhood. And so I didn't really think anything of it. Well, um, a couple minutes go by and I peek my head out to look at Mojo, uh, the hog island boa that was out, outside. And he had a bird in his coils and he's manipulating it around trying to figure out where the head's at on it. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> so I went out there and started shooting some video of it and stuff and uh, got some cool pictures of it. But yeah, that was uh, pretty, pretty remarkable that he got that. I did not see that coming. And what's really interesting is um, when he did that, and now I didn't see him catch it, it would have been really cool to see that. Um, better to get it on video, but uh, <laughs> What, uh, what was really neat was that afterwards, um, when I would put him on the branches again, he, he would go into a different kind of posture. And I, again, speculating just from what I'm seeing and kind of putting together here, and I think this is what they do in the wild, is that there'll be a branch and he makes himself stick to the branch and he'll keep a profile with the branch. And sometimes he'll kind of turn himself sideways a little bit on it. And so I think what happened was, hello. And uh, so I think what happened was, is that in the wild, they, st they sit themselves sideways and they just sit and wait. And then when a bird comes and lands, they, they wrap up and bag it. Um, and now because after he caught that bird and when I put him out on those branches, he goes into that posture every time, has himself the length of the branch, and he'll kind of turn himself a little sideways and he won't move. He'll keep himself dead still. And what's cool is a hog island bow is kind of already have um, like a driftwood kind of coloration to them. So along a dead stick, I mean, he really disappears. That's cool. Um, if there was any other kind of foliage or, um, you know, sticks popping up out of it or, you know, dead leaves or something, it would even give him that much more of an advantage but he sits sideways with it. And I think, like I said, I think it's because when a bird goes to land on the branch, they act as kind of like a, like a trap, like a snare. And all of a sudden they just wind up on them and then they got a meal. That's amazing. That is so cool. And A, it's cool that you can see that behavior now because it's maybe it wouldn't have been something that you would have noticed until that, that scenario happened. And I, I do wonder how he got that bird. If that bird did come and land on the apparatus that you had, or it was just flying by, like you said, it would have been pretty amazing to see, but it's just so cool to see their, their instincts just, you know, firing in all cylinders, even though they're captive animals. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's, that's the thing is that, um, you know, you can, we can tame them down and we can do this and that, but at the end of the day, they still are an animal. They still have, um, you know, those drives and it's just like a cat. You know what I mean? Like you can have a cat that you raised inside its whole life and on year four, let it outside. Now, granted, it's not going to be a, a, a bird killer right away, but after a while, um, some folks are walking by, um, <laughs> after a while, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna see that cat develop its skills and, and it will start to, you know, actually hunt prey. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's really cool. And, and one thing jumping back to the large cohab enclosure that I was thinking about is you, you actually have, you can make a, like if, if you kept your animals separately, and again, this is not a, it's not a rule. So anybody can keep their animals how they like. And if people aren't comfortable cohabbing, they don't have to. But I was just thinking about for my boas the other day, like if I may, I could make a, a large enclosure that could keep them both. And that would take up less space than two medium sized enclosures. Basically, you know, you could give them so much more space without right. eating more. Like you have a huge enclosure, but it's not taking up an entire room. Like they have way more space than they're going to ever need way more than most people provide yet. It's not, you know, five or four medium sized enclosures would be a whole room for you. Right. My, my thing is, is, um, you know, animals like to move, right? Like that's, the root word of animal is anima, right? And that translated, it means um, animated or spirited, right? So animals like to move. It's, it's what they're meant to do, right? And so 
when we take an animal, whether it's a horse or a dog or a snake or whatever, and then we confine it to a small space, um, you know, you're not going to see the kind of behaviors that you would in a larger enclosure or a larger space for that animal. Um, and you're not going to see them as mentally or as physically healthy because they're, they're not going to have the stimulation. They're not going to have the exercise. Exercise is good for everybody and everything, right? Um, and so when you keep a ball python or a leopard gecko in a little tub and a lot of people don't take them out, you know, that animal is going to get very lethargic. It's going to get, um, I've heard Lori Torini say, uh, learned hopelessness, mm -hmm. you know, learning that, you know, there's just no way out of this thing. I'm going to be stuck in this tub forever. And, um, you're going to see animals get stagnant, you know, mentally stagnant. Um, and so for me, I, I want to offer them the largest enclosure I can, the largest space I can. Um, and so for them to be able to exercise and to move around, you know, for, for me to look at them, don't get me wrong. A, a huge enclosure is awesome. It's, it's impressive. It's uh, a focal point. It's a conversation starter and, and it's just something fun, um, you know, to, to, to experience. Um, I mean, granted, yeah, sure. They can survive in something small, like they can be alive and for many years, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's people that have had a ball python in a tub for 20 years. As sad as that sounds. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, is that animal happy, you know? And so if we're talking about, you know, um, I, I make the, the, um, analogy a lot with a horse, you know, you wouldn't buy a horse and keep it in a dumpster. You, know, you wouldn't buy a horse and keep it in a, a, a stable its whole life. You want that horse to run around in a pasture, you know, take it on the trail. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, it's really the same thing when it comes to having a, a custom enclosure or a, a large enclosure. And, you know, like I said, the space thing, like you said, you know, having, you know, two boas in one big enclosure beats a boa each in a, a small enclosure. Right. Mm. And the thing is, is, as long as the boas get along and you don't have any issues with any kind of, you know, territorial uh, disputes or anything like that, which you can have with lizards mostly and turtles, so they'll get territorial, but a lot of, a lot of snakes don't. Um, there are ways of breaking lizards and, and turtles from the territoriality and stuff. And I can talk about that at a different time, but, um, but as long as the snakes get along and, uh, you know, you offer them, all of their requirements, you know, the humidity, fresh air. Um, I don't know if I told you, but on my enclosure, I actually have a vent system. Uh, it's an exhaust fan. It's, uh, it's actually an inline fan that I had bought for uh, dryer vents. Okay. So it's basically just like a tube with a fan in it. And then I made a housing and I have the fan in there and then I have it on uh, a timer. So about three times a day, it turns on for, I think like 20 minutes or something. And then it cycles all the air out and brings off fresh air. So is it drawing? It's drawing air. air in, it's it's drawing air out, right? Or is it blowing fresh air in? Yeah, yeah. It's it's pulling it's pulling the air out. So okay, it's an exhaust gotcha. fan, and then it and then the uh, the ventilation that I have, as far as like open open vent uh, uh, ventilation, is on the top. So the vent fan is at the bottom. So it's pulling the air down. And pulling all the stagnant air that sits at the bottom out. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And maybe we could just run through a little bit of uh, of, of building your own enclosures because you do, I think, pretty much all your own DIY enclosures, or you've done a lot of them. So maybe that's how we can wrap up this conversation for how how people can get into building their own enclosures because I think it is sometimes pretty intimidating for people that don't have a construction background or a carpentry background, but it's it's probably easier than than it seems. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm definitely not an expert <laughs> by any means. Um, I, I do construction and I have done construction for, you know, most of my life. Um, so, I mean, it does give me an edge, but all the stuff that I do, um, it's not rocket science. It's all stuff that you could figure out. Um, you know, obviously it does help to have the right tools. You know, I have table saw, miter saw, stuff like that, um, drills and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, it's really actually quite easy and it's a lot cheaper, 
I think than than people realize. I mean, granted, the cost of materials have, have gone up quite a bit, but um, but for example, the enclosure that I built, I think total dollar amount um, that I have invested into it is maybe like um, maybe like thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, which is insanely little compared to what that would cost if you went and bought it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Now, you know, obviously if you paid somebody to do it, you got to pay the guy to do it. But, um, but you know, a competent builder could build what I built in probably maybe even less time than I did it. Cause I think I have 150 hours of time into the, the large bow enclosure that I have. So what materials do you do you use? I know you also did a really nice uh, chameleon enclosure that you also posted on your YouTube channel. And that was, I think that was mostly wood. Do you have favorite materials that you gravitate towards? Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a wood guy. I love wood. I think it looks nice. I think it's, um, it's really easy to work with. It's readily available for the most part. Um, and, and it's sturdy. You know what I mean? You can build really sturdy, uh, enclosures out of wood and um and you know there's all sorts of different stuff you can do you can do stone you can do um brick you can do you know glass with a a wood frame you can do you know metal frame with glass i mean there's all sorts of stuff you can do the sky is the sky is kind of the limit um for me i i have a lot of experience with wood so i can I can do more with that than I could say with plastics or something like that. I'm sure there's plenty of guys out there that are great with PVC and, um, you know, making those PVC enclosures and stuff. Um, for me, I like the, the look of the wood. I feel it's, it's classy looking. Um, you can stain it and make it look, you know, various different colors. You can paint it if you want to. Um, and the ability to be flexible with what you're doing. Um, with wood, I, I like. Also, wood is is nice for uh, insulation value. Mm-hmm. A lot, I, I feel like it's a lot more insulating than say just glass or plastic alone. When you when you put the glass through the door, like the I, I know in the chameleon chameleon enclosure, it looked like plate glass. Does that did you just pick that up from Home Depot or something, or is there specific, or was that maybe? Uh, no. Was, go ahead. Oh no. Uh, I kind of saw where you're going with that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> but, go for uh, it. Yeah. The the uh, the glass that I get, I I have custom made. It's it's tempered glass. Um, just because with plate glass, if you know your elbow goes through it, or say like you know the animal falls and knocks into it hard enough, you know it could it could shatter easily. Um, you know, I've got a dog, and I've got uh, uh, nieces and nephews that come over a lot, and the last thing I want is one of them swinging around a toy and bang it into the glass and then it shatters, you know? Yeah. Um, So with the chameleon cage and with the, um, the boa cage that I have, I built the frames for the doors and the windows um, basically just out of wood and then made like a channel, like a little groove that the glass would fit in. I have the glass, uh, ordered by the glass company uh, give them the measurements a lot of times what i'll do is i'll bring them the frames and then they can measure it out because for some reason when i give places measurements it always comes back a different size either too small or too big so uh a lot of times i just drop off the frames with them and then they they fit it um and then i'll just set the the glass either using like a a heavy duty glue or a mixture of uh, glue and um, uh, tax to tack it in place. Um, and then it's just a matter of mounting the, the door, uh, to the frame of the, the cage. Mm. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. That's, uh, that's good. Yeah, I think tempered glass is probably the way to go. That's what I have in, in a couple of my enclosures as well. And, uh, def- even though it's a little more expensive, it's probably safer. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the main, the main concern is just, I don't want it to shatter. Mm. Well, Rex, I really enjoyed this conversation. Like I said, this I think there's there's parts of this conversation that may be uncomfortable for people who just who maybe envision or interpret their reptiles in a certain way, but I think it's really important that we start seeing 
approaching animals with that loving respect like you talked about and and sort of breaking some of those barriers like you said a snake is not a dog it's never going to act like a mammal it's never going to act like a human but there's certain levels of respect that you can actually connect with animals with reptiles in ways that i think many people actually aren't capable of so i really enjoyed that is is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you wanted to mention before we officially wrapped up or did we kind of hit everything i think we hit a lot of stuff i did kind of want to um kind of talk or I, I wanted to give a shout out to my subscribers because I've got, I've made some really cool friends, including you um, on YouTube. And it just seems like there's so many cool people out there and the ability to connect with them and share stories, share videos and stuff like that has been really neat. Um, this, the YouTube experience for me has been nothing but positive so far. Um, meeting you, getting to know you, uh, Lori Torini, Liam, um, a lot of those guys, every guest that you've had on the show has been spectacular. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a hermit crab guy, but I love to share that hermit crab episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, a lot of people um, did. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, you're, you have a really, a really awesome show. And, uh, and so if any of my subscribers are watching this, hit the, the notifications and hit the uh, subscribe button on, on this channel because you, you really do have an awesome podcast, man. It's, just, it's very entertaining and it's very educational. Thank you, man. I really do appreciate that. And I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad that we were able to connect through YouTube as well. That, that's great. Can you let everybody know where they can find your YouTube channel? What, what, what's it called and, and where they, what, what sort of videos are on there? Yeah, well, um, it's just me, Rex Calubra's All Animal Channel is the name of the YouTube site. And then... Um, I also have a Pinterest. If anybody does Pinterest, it's just my name, Lex Calubra. Um, and yeah, my, my channel is really all about just kind of exploring um, the intelligence and um, just the wonders of, of all sorts of different animals, whether it's my personal pet or, you know, the fish that I dive with out here. I've got all sorts of dive videos. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, check that out. But I, my whole goal is I just want people to see animals in a different light. Um, I think there's so much more going on than, uh, than meets the eye. And when we take a second to um, step out of ourselves and put ourselves in their positions, you know, again, you know, looking at us as, you know, I'm a scary creature, so I need to, um, you know, win them over. I need to show them that I'm not a threat. And I feel like when animals don't perceive us as a threat, we can have some of the most amazing interactions. Um, one story I did, want, I did kind of want to tell was uh, years ago, I was working at um, a maintenance place. I was doing home maintenance and, you know, repairs and things like that. And one of the things they had me do is they had me go around this, um, this mini mall, it's a strip mall, right? And just kind of picking up garbage and making sure all the bulbs were working and whatever. Well, I was watching this spring, uh, this, this one particular spring, I was watching these uh, black capped chickadees make a nest in one of the overhangs of the, of the mall. And, you know, they'd come and go to the nest as they were taking care of the baby. And then um, I think it was, I don't know, late spring, something like that. And I'm doing my rounds and I'm walking and I see this baby bird on the ground. And I'm like, oh, shoot. And so right as I realize what's going on, you know, there's this baby bird on the ground. There's these two guys that are walking up and they, they're not paying attention. They don't see what's going on. And the one dude almost stepped on the baby bird. And I literally had to put my hands on his chest. And totally get in this guy's face to stop him from stepping on this bird. And I quickly turned around and picked it up. And he was all upset about me, but I kind of didn't really pay attention to him. And I, so I picked up this baby bird. And it's a little black capped chickadee from the nest. And so I'm, I'm cradling this little bird. And I, I kind of thought she was going to freak out and start trying to fly away. But she stayed really calm and just sat in my hand. And so I walked her to this area where there was a bunch of trees and stuff. And she had all of her feathers. It just kind of seemed like she was a little, I don't know, shell, shell shocked or something. And so um, I brought her to this area where there's these trees. 
and I put her in a low hanging branch. And then I sat and watched for maybe like 10 minutes or so and said, all right, well, that's pretty much all I can do for you. And that night I come home and I'm letting my dog out and I'm sitting on my fitness table, just kind of twiddling my thumbs, right? Just watching the dog. She's out doing her business in the yard. And uh, all of a sudden an adult black cat chickadee comes and lands right on the picnic table directly in front of me, like a couple feet from my face, does this little song and dance, cheap, cheap, cheap for maybe like 20 seconds and then flies to a, a low hanging branch, cheap, 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 and then flies away. And I mean, how else do you explain that? Yeah. It was almost like a thank you. And do you so think that, just, that was an I adult? That, that was an adult chickadee? It was an it was an adult, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I've never, I mean, I've never had a bird come up to me and do a little song and dance like that ever in my life. That was that was yeah. insane. Um, but I think the takeaway is, um, you know, there's more going on than, than we think. Yeah. You know, they're they're smarter than we realize, and I think we're smarter than we realize. You know, I think I think there's kind of this popular concept right now that like. I don't know. Everything, everything is just kind of dumb. You know, everything like, I don't know. People are dumb. Things are dumb. Everything's just kind of dumb. And I, I don't think that's really the case. I think that there's an interconnectedness. And um, I think there's a, a, a very profound intelligence and uh, a profoundness with, with creatures. And I mean, I could go on a, days and days about some of the just crazy things that I've seen uh, with animals and interacting with animals and stuff, but um, we'll have to say that for another time. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely have to have you back on at some point as well. And I think the moral of the story is staying calm and patient and respectful. You'll start seeing behaviors from animals that they wouldn't show you otherwise. You know, being if if you're a threat and you're making them scared, they're not going to behave naturally, and you're not going to see all these incredible things. So I think that's a that's a really great way to to end the podcast. Rex, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate that. Like I said, we'll do another one at some point because I'd love to hear more of your stories and and you've already plugged the channel. So I do really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Dude, thank you. It's an honor to be on here. Thank you. All right, that is the end of that episode. Rex, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I had a blast chatting with you. I really did enjoy listening to all your stories. And I think, as I said through the intro, the way you conceptualize keeping animals, you know, that treating each individual as a sentient being is so important. I think everybody, if anybody keeping captive animals should use that as a base foundation framework in order to move forward with their care. If you make the assumption that the animals are much more sentient and much more intelligent and have a much higher level of perception than you originally thought, if you just max all those things out as far as they can go, even if you're wrong, you're going to end up doing a great job caring for them. There's almost no bad there's almost no bad outcome for assuming that the animals are much smarter and much more intelligent than we than they actually are. And in reality, they are probably far more intelligent than we actually think. As we said many times in the podcast, there is such a little amount of information when it comes to understanding reptile and amphibian intelligence and really any animal intelligence that we just don't actually know. We don't know how these animals perceive the world. So if you can start at the assumption that they are just as smart as you or I, I think you're going to make some really good ethical decisions when it comes to keeping animals. So Rex, thank you so much for getting us all on that right pathway. If you enjoyed the episode, thank you so much for listening. You can share it on social media, Facebook or Instagram would be greatly appreciated. If you're looking for more information on the episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. If you are interested in supporting the podcast financially, you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home for as little as $3 per month. And thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. We have some really excited things, exciting things coming up in the next couple of months. So I don't even want to say too much, but there's some, well, I'll give you a small hint. There's some changes that are going to be happening in this room, which are really exciting that you'll, you'll be able to follow along on YouTube. And there's also a few changes going to happen with the actual podcast as well. This show will remain the same. I probably already said too much, but there's some cool things happening. So I'm going to leave it at that and I will catch you guys next episode.